So it's a cold and windy day today in northwest Iowa, just over the border from South Dakota. This is the Gitche Manitou Natural Preserve or State Preserve, the site of the 1973 killings that happened here. Four boys were shot to death by three brothers and one sole survivor, a 13-year-old girl. Now this story just gets crazier and crazier. And obviously it's a story of horrendous murders, but it's also a story of amazing survival. Now, as you can see, Gitche Manitou is very open and really out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's nothing around. Similar to what it was like back in the 1970s, I wanted to come here, check this place out, see how it looks now, and also straighten out some big misconceptions about this place and about these murders. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take you through this whole area and show you to the best of anyone's knowledge where everything happened, explain to you how it happened, and uh, tell you the story of the 1973 Gitche Manitou murders. Five teenagers Stuart Beatty, his younger brother, Dana Beatty, Roger Essam, Mike Hadrath, and 13-year-old Sandra Chesky arrived right here in Stuart Beatty's van for an evening of sitting by the fire and playing the guitar. Now, not far away is the Stone Shelter. This has really become synonymous with the Gitche Manitou murders. I don't know what this was originally. I doubt it was a house. There's very little information online about it. It was most likely some sort of a shelter being out. It has this huge fireplace in the middle and a real rough stone floor. And although this building is right in the same area, nothing actually ever happened here. The four boys were not murdered in this building. Uh, it wasn't too far away, but it was not in this building. There's a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people believe that they actually had a fire going in this building, but that is not factual. This is all from the eyewitness account of Sandra Tresky. She said they may have gone into the stone shelter just for a bit before continuing their way down this path to find a little site to hang out and enjoy the park. Gitche Manitou is an interesting area. It has all these rock outcroppings everywhere, which actually play a part in this story, in this murder. Now the area I'm going to show you where they had their campfire is an approximation because as you can imagine, things have changed a bit. The forest has changed. The area is most likely way more overgrown than it was. The BCI agents who investigated these murders, even the local sheriffs way back then, all could not recall exactly where this area was. And even Sandra herself, when she came out here, could not remember the exact area, but it is likely that it is right here. It was dark and there was no one else around. The five teenagers set up somewhere in this area, built a fire. Stuart Beatty, the oldest, the 18 year old, had his guitar. They were just hanging out, apparently not drinking, but smoking a little bit of marijuana, which plays a part in this story. Now, according to Sandra, a heavy fog came into this area, making it even darker than it was before. It's dark, it's nighttime, it's foggy. And while the kids are down there enjoying the fire, enjoying the guitar sounds, little did they know that they were not alone in this park. The three Friar brothers had also entered the park in hopes of poaching a deer that night. The brothers heard the guitar sounds, heard the kids talking and for some reason decided that instead of hunting deer, they were going to possibly hunt humans. 
Now what happened is most likely the Friar brothers crept up these rocks as quietly as they could, giving them an excellent vantage point over the kids that were just down, down the hill. As the kids are down here hanging out, they start to hear cracking of twigs and rustling of leaves. And they, they, they start making jokes about what could possibly be up there, trying to scare each other, saying it was a bear, saying it was an animal. Little did they know that it was actually the three Friar brothers armed with shotguns and they were actually stalking them. At some point, Roger Essam walked to the edge of the light away from the fire and yelled at something like, who's there, or who are you, or what are you doing? Right then, a shot rang out and Roger was shot dead. Another shot hit Stuart, the oldest boy, and he laid next to the fire. The other three kids tried to hide behind trees. It is then that the Friar brothers came right to the ledge here and told the kids to come out. Now they were lying to the kids. They were saying that they were police, that they were here to arrest them for smoking weed. The three kids came out of behind the trees. Mike Hadrath walks towards the, the ledge saying, why are you, if you're police, why are you shooting at us? And right then they shot him in the chest. The three brothers come down from this ledge here. At this point, Roger is most likely dead. Stuart is injured very badly. Mike Hadrath is hit and hurt badly. So they remain somewhere down in this area, marching the kids around, bossing them around with guns, lying to them, saying that they were police and that they were, the kids were going to be arrested. At this point, you might be asking yourself, why would these brothers do this? Well, they were all really career criminals. They all had rap sheets. They all had records. In fact, believe it or not, James, the middle-aged brother, I believe he was 24, actually was in jail at the time. And he was on some sort of work release program where he kept his job that he had. So he would work his job during the day and then go back to jail at night. And he decided that he wanted to hang out with his brothers that night. So his younger brother called the jail pretending to be James's boss and said he had to work a late shift. And he was free and clear. 1973, crazy to think. So the three brothers were free to do whatever they wanted. At the time that this was going on, they saw Sandra. They also believed that Dana Beatty, the youngest brother, he was 14, the younger brother of Stuart Beatty. He had longer hair. They believed that he was a girl too. So it was most likely rape motivated. The brothers end up marching Sandra, Dana, Stuart and Mike back up to the cars, back up to their blue truck and Stuart's van. Now, Roger, unfortunately, is dead back there at the fire pit. Now, they possibly might have brought them up to this rock shelter for a little bit while deciding on what to do with them. But ultimately, they brought them over to their cars. It is this exact area where Sandra had her hands tied behind her back. She was put into Alan Fryer's pickup truck and driven away. That was the last time that Sandra saw Stuart Beatty, Dana Beatty, and Mike Hadrath. Those three boys were right next to their van and they were executed right here, right in this area. From this point on, the story really becomes about Sandra Tresky and her survival. Um, after the other two brothers kill the three boys, they jump into Stewart's van and they take off. Sandra is driven around by Alan Fryer. Their rendezvous is an abandoned farm, something like 20 to 30 miles away. And that's where the other two boys, the other two brothers meet up with Alan after ditching the van. Now I wanna stress that this is not 
the abandoned farm that Alan took Sandra to. Um, but this is a good stand-in, most likely a good representation of what it possibly looked like. It was at a farm just like this where uh, the other brothers met up with Alan and I believe the story goes that while Alan and David were off figuring out what they were going to do with Sandra, James, the middle brother, the one who really was in jail at the time, went into the truck and unfortunately raped Sandra. At that point, James and David left to drive James back to prison, and Alan was left with the task of most likely killing Sandra. While he was trying to get her to go into the barn or into the house, she got very upset, she refused, she ran back into the truck. Alan felt bad for her. Believe it or not, he drove her home. It was very late, probably about four o'clock in the morning at that point. Before he dropped her off, he told her that she better not say anything to anybody or he would come back, they would kill her and kill her whole family. Probably the craziest point though was that he asked for her phone number. He said he wanted to take her out in a few days. That's where this, that's what the mentality was with these guys. He actually thought he was going to be able to take her out on a date. Just a few hours later in that morning, Sandra hitchhiked to the, to the Sioux Falls Police Department and she reported the rape and reported what had happened. Of course, at the time, she did not know that her four friends were dead because Alan was telling her that they had only shot the kids with tranquilizers. Now, only some of the police believed her with this. They, some of them actually thought that she was involved in this, that she was involved in the murder of, her, of four of her friends because they said, well, why would they kill those four friends and let you go after raping you? Fortunately, though, some of the police did believe her by pure happenstance that after about two weeks of searching for this abandoned farm, that she just happened to see it. There it is. That's the farm. That's where they brought me. She recognized it by a big red fuel tank that was next to the garage. And just at that moment, unbelievably, Alan Fryer happened to be driving down the dirt road with his blue truck, the very blue truck that he took her away in and brought her to that very farm. And it was right then that he was arrested and it went to trial. The three were indicted. And believe it or not, they are all in jail for the rest of their life without the possibility of parole. Just an incredible situation. Uh, fortunately, she survived it. That whole thing happened at a farm just like this. Back out at the Gitche Manitou Natural Preserve here, I wanted to in this video showing you a kind of a little private memorial that's here uh, Sandra and some members of each of the four boys families came out here and had a little private ceremony not too long ago a couple years ago and they created this little memorial for them which, which is nice now that family member Sandra can come out here and 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 be with the boys I have no doubt that those four boys are resting in peace. So that's the story of the Gitche Manitou murders from 1973 in extreme northwest corner of Iowa. All right, I'm getting back on the road. Thanks for watching.